Welcome to The Cure Chronicles. I'm your host, Jeff Galvin. I'm delighted today to be joined by Orbit Clanton, an HIV AIDS activist, advocate, and public speaker. In 1982, Orbit was diagnosed with what doctors called GRID, or gay-related immune deficiency, now known as HIV. Remaining skeptical for 20 years, a trip to the emergency room in 2001 caused him to come to terms with his diagnosis. Today, Orbit is an HIV treatment activist and the co-founder of Perceptions for People with Disabilities, a New York City-based organization that helps people who are living with HIV and are visually impaired, hard of hearing, or mentally challenged. He continues to support various AIDS organizations, including serving as a civil society partner at UNAIDS. Thank you for joining me, Orbit. Thank you, Jeff, for having me. Yeah, really, our pleasure. Um, you've got an amazing uh, background um, relating to HIV. I mean, first of all, it's just remarkable that you could be diagnosed in 1982 and go 20 years um, it, it, without an effective treatment and to be here talking to me today. Uh, that is seems, you know, miraculous to me, quite frankly. What what do you uh, you know? How did you do it? You know, what was it that got you through all those years when so many people who contracted HIV uh, were were not able to survive it? Well, I can't give a scientific answer to that, other than I just didn't believe in the beginning that. I had grid or the unknown at the time because back in 1982 to uh, mid-80s, individuals were succumbing to an unknown disease, which we now know is HIV. But I said to myself, my mind, that no, I am not going to let this disease take me out. So the power of my faith, the power of the mind, I asked providers and scientists, and they said, well, you were one of the slow progressors. So that's the best explanation I can give. I'm happy that I'm still here. <laughs> we are too. <laughs> the, um, that's interesting. So slow progressor, that is actually um, a known uh, type of condition that seems to be genetic. Right? The occasional person comes along who can control the levels of their viremia naturally. And it seems to be a rare thing. And maybe that, you know, um, I guess when you look at some of the stats from the 80s, where about 95% of all people that contracted HIV uh, perished with AIDS. Uh, but that meant, you know, one in 20 uh, survived it. And, and you know, part of it might have been, you know, you were gifted with a, a slightly different uh, genetics that helped your immune system to uh, persist through the attack. Uh, actually, that's at the root of uh, that whole idea of, law, of, of uh, uh, what are called uh, slow progressors or non-progressors. Uh, is at the core of something that we're trying to develop right now uh, to modify people's immune system to get that benefit, you know, so that they might be able to live with HIV, but free of any treatment, right? You know, that, you know, suppressed, but not having to take drugs to suppress it. And maybe you were somebody who actually had that naturally. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, you know, so you've really seen the whole arc of this history, everything, the treatment paradigms, everything. You know, what have, what have you seen in terms of progress forward on HIV and even, you know, sort of the stigma surrounding HIV uh, that people are, you know, experience um, in, in this uh, environment? Well, the progression from GRID, which I never used that term, nor did I accept that term, um, that whole analysis that it's a gay disease, which all of us now in science know is not true. And when you look at the global number of individuals living with AIDS or HIV, I should say, 
more individuals who are of the heterosexual persuasion have HIV versus quote unquote um, the gay population. But what that really did create is the ongoing stigma surrounding HIV to this day. And part of what I am doing along with others is we're trying to um, re-educate and make the norm of reducing, eliminating, stigmatizing language when it comes to individuals who are diagnosed with HIV. I've also noticed, and it's a good thing, that when you mention HIV, there once was a time that people wouldn't even mention it. I remember when individuals were um, dying from HIV slash AIDS, that families, houses of worship wouldn't acknowledge. They rather say that, oh, my brother, my uncle, or my family member um, passed away from cancer. I mean, think about that. They would rather say that this person died of cancer than to say um, they passed away from HIV slash AIDS. Now, with the advancement of antiretrovirals, that phrase that HIV is no longer a death sentence uh, is true, even though that in itself is still stigmatizing when you say things like that. But I'm just pleased that we are at the point, think about it, we're at the point of talking about cures. That word was never used. And when it would be used back in the day, you would be told, listen, don't even think about that. Let's just try to come up with some type of therapy to keep people alive. So that's one place where we are that I'm very happy about. That's great. I mean, um, it seems it seems like what you're saying is that you've seen progress over time. Uh, yet, you know, the I think you acknowledge that there's still you know a level of stigma associated with this, and there's more that can be done. Um, you know, how can people, you know, embrace this idea? Right. I mean, ideas are powerful that we you know want to eliminate the stigma of HIV. You know, how can they embrace that idea and how can they become part of the movement to reduce the stigma? Well, having platforms like this, I always hope and would like to see more individuals who are living with HIV come forward. But I do respect where a person is at when they talk about telling the whole world, because despite the progress that has been made, um, being HIV can have dire consequences depending on where you live at, both here domestically and especially globally. But with that said, if there was a greater visibility of individuals who are living with HIV, doing well, having a good quality of life um, from all walks of life. I think that would really help with destigmatizing the disease itself. So you could always, when you're just having conversations with individuals, first of all, I always say that everyone should know their status. And we have awareness days here in this country for a purpose. And those awareness days is just what it says, awareness. That like at Thanksgiving, when you're sitting around the table, maybe you're with your family that you haven't seen or Christmas time when we're gathering, bring up the question, oh, by the way, um, how are you doing? You talk about your health and this and that. Ask the question, well, 
Do you know your HIV status? Or when was the last time you took an HIV test? Hmm. The response may be, well, why are you asking me that? <laughs> I'm not doing anything that would warrant it. But then you give them a quick education and say, listen, um, first of all, you, you're right. They'll probably say, well, I'm not gay. <laughs> but it's so funny. I was just thinking that. That's why I was laughing, right? You see, they could fall right into the stigma right at that moment, right? But I think you're right. You know, the, the openness is a great idea. It is. And when we look at the information that was delivered to us during the pandemic, um, learning about SARS-2, COVID, right? Um, across this country and the globe, they educated people. I think it would be helpful if the government, and trust me, I've suggested this many times, quick PSAs across the country that are short and to the point to educate individuals about the science and the facts of HIV, specifically that it is not a gay disease and anyone can be at risk. Mm -hmm. I think that would really help with getting people to understand because as they say, oh, they have that aha moment. Really? It's not a gay disease? So. Yeah, yeah. No, I, because it, because it's a virus, and if you know your status, you can take a daily pill that would make you basically normal, right? You would have a relatively normal life expectancy. Uh, you would not be contagious. Uh, you could never progress to AIDS. You would minimize the effect of that disease. So, you know, that question that you're saying is like, it is so important. It, and it reminds me a little bit of... of um, Harvey Milk's um, strategy for actually reducing the stigma surrounding, you know, gay and lesbians, you know, and then the whole, you know, whole, whole non-traditional community at this point. You know, what he said is they don't realize that we're among them, right? <laughs> and that we're not monsters. So right. introduce yourself, right? I'm exactly. living with, H you know, go out and tell your family that they're living, that you're living with HIV. And they'll realize, okay, you'll you'll start a tiny little, you know, club of people that don't fall into that stigma anymore because you'll have a chance to explain. And so I think your idea is a really good one, but I also see how difficult it would be for people. And I, so I didn't know anybody who would admit that they were HIV positive before I got into the HIV cure business. Now, you know, everybody does with me. So I know so many people straight and gay that have HIV. I hear so many stories. Um, but I think that, you know, it, it does take a certain tremendous level of bravery to be, especially amongst the first to go ahead and, and implement that. So I love that there are examples out there and we've got, we've got several of them on this series that talk about it and normalize it, right? Because this is something that should be normalized. It should be. But I do respect individuals who may want to, but haven't reached that level of comfortability to do it. You know, I mean, I've been living with it so long, and my attitude is I've heard it all. I've been insulted. I've been called names or overhearing things. But I'm at the point where I don't care Good about you. it. Yep. In reality, I would say to those who are living with HIV, just take small steps if you haven't disclosed. Find someone that you can trust that will support you. Um, you don't have to you know, do a grand announcement. Then again, Another way you could just go to your Facebook page, for instance, and put it out there <laughs> and don't read the comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's that's really interesting. So are you taking an antiretroviral now or are you just like you're a slow progressor and you don't have to worry about it? No, I am on a one a day um, antiretroviral therapy, which 
I take it every day. Sometimes people would say, how can you take a pill every day? Because I am 100% adherent. Again, my philosophy is that, okay, I want to stay alive, take this pill. And by the way, I was someone that wasn't good at taking pills. But now I just do it one, two, three when I first get up in the morning and just go ahead and start my day. One of four people in the United States is on antidepressants. They take a pill a day too, right? What's the big deal? They, um, you know, yeah, you're right. You got to pick your life and commit to it. And if you decide that's good for you, okay, you know, it takes some self-discipline to remember stuff every day. Uh, And I'm not good at that. I, I like to, you know, everybody likes to just be free to do whatever's on their mind at any given moment, but that's not how life is, is it? You know, so that's interesting. So at some, at one point you had a hard time conforming to the regimen, but now you just like, what, you just have a regular time during the day, you just pop the pill and it's, is it, you know, is it that simple and is it not a big deal? And does it, you know, are you getting the positive effects and, and, and avoiding most, you know, avoiding the negative effects? Um, Well, I'm doing very well. And it's your state of mind. And I do understand that in the beginning, individuals may see taking um, a ART as being burdensome. And there were. I mean, for those of you who may know, there was a time when antiretrovirus came out. The pill burden was extremely burdensome. It could be up to 36 pills within the course of a day, morning, afternoon, and evening and it was debilitating so now with the advancements um i see it as this we have a lot of things to worry about in life you know bills um taking care of our family things like that here is something that you can do you can choose to do or not do you can sweat over it every day and become depressed about it or just say to yourself, okay, this will save my life. This keeps me going. And as we age, I'm sure many of you know, you start to develop other comorbidities. So you're taking other medication as well. But then there are those who are young but they take multivitamins. Um, Just, I say, you know, it's in your best interest. Then just do it. Don't complicate it. Okay, take the pill and move on. So so you've been on uh, antiretroviral since, what, 2001? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you you got 20 years without them and, and 20 years with them. I mean, that's remarkable. 40 years of HIV history. The only other person I know who's got that level of history is Marcus Conant, our uh, our uh, um, our CMO, which uh, stands for Chief Medical Officer. So he runs all of our clinical trials for, for our um, HIV developments. And, um, you know, he was a doctor uh, and gay on the front lines of the epidemic in uh san francisco in uh 1980 okay so he's even got a part uh, a bit part in uh, the movie uh in the band played on so you see oh, his yeah. name come up yeah yeah which i i recommend that movie to, to anybody uh just because it's a great drama and you know and i also think that just in general hiv and aids awareness is leads to good things i'm meeting more and more people who are 28 to 30 plus years, um, even individuals who um, were born with HIV through vertical transmission um, are in their 30s. So, yeah, four decades of HIV already, you know, in the rear view mirror. But it's just, I think that, you know, you are a rare person who's seen it all you know, yeah. uh, look through that whole thing. And, 
you know, I find that that fascinating. I hope you're writing a book or whatever. And uh, but uh, but certainly this must come out in your advocacy and your activism and and so forth. So t- tell me some of the things that you're participating in that, uh, you know, have um, meaning or value, uh, you know, sort of in uh, in, in, in your own mind, uh, you know, that you're trying to progress forward. I mean, what what sort of initiatives are you working on in, in the various different activities that you're doing? Well, one, as I have mentioned, I am now working towards changing the language, removing stigmatizing language, because that's a barrier to people seeking out HIV care or even knowing their status. Um, and I have been invited to do presentations on that. For instance, one of the things I always say, when you're having conversations, someone may use this phrase, oh yeah, I know Orbit. Yeah, he's HIV infected for 40 years. Uh, Don't say that. (laughs) If you're referring to an individual you know, people first language, um, the proper way to do it or the non-stigmatizing phrase would be, oh, I know Orbit, yeah, he was diagnosed with HIV or he's HIV positive. Don't use infected because that one, it hurts when you hear it. It also makes individual not want to know their status because if you're hanging with your friends and family and stigmatizing language is being used surrounding HIV and those living with HIV, then you say to yourself, I, number one, don't want it. I don't want to know my status because now I'll fall into that category that my friends make jokes about. And some of the terms are really, really um, disrespectful. One is in some of the urban places, if someone passes, I've heard terms just out on the street, oh, John passed away. Really, what happened? Well, he had the monster. Wow. Now imagine you don't know your status, but maybe you think you may have been exposed Part of you then says to yourself, I don't want to be classified and put into that group. So that's something that I am really championing um, towards. I always am on Capitol Hill whenever I get an opportunity is because we have to keep funding going. You know, HIV isn't cured yet. So there have been times when I've been asked to speak to, you know, different appropriation committees um, to the question of why should we continue to fund HIV? You know, that question comes up in Congress. That's bizarre to me. I can't believe it. No, think about it. Think about it. (laughs) The, The landscape. I'm there for a reason. But the answer I would like to give, and maybe one of these days I may just say, excuse me, I didn't get the memo. <laughs> Was HIV cured? <laughs> you know, but. That's, a, that's a good sarcastic way to put it. But I mean, don't they realize that there's HIV, uh, you know, people that are living with HIV all around them, even amongst their staff? You know, this is just crazy. There's 1.2 million people and it's an epidemic still. You know, the, the HIV new infections can be up to 50,000 a year. And polio was only 60,000 at its peak, right? This is Ooh. serious business. And now that we have established that nobody is immune, right? And Congress, even Congress people should be able to get that through their heads, right? All yeah. right. Well, this is a national problem. And until it's, you know, until it's completely controlled and completely within our control, it needs to be funded. Even if it's just to improve HIV medications, right? Um, the easier it is for people to take them and get them, right? The more likely it is that they take them and get them. And remember, you were talking about like 
um, I think we, uh, you mentioned the idea of um, public service uh, ads, you know, that, you know, educate on HIV. One of my favorite ones was U equals U. Now, I know it only came out because, you know, probably drug companies realized, hey, we can sell more of this stuff, you know. No, <laughs> it, no. It, you know. You know where it came from? It where? came from individuals who were living with HIV. Yeah. Okay. But wh- where did they get the money? The, like, who funded that campaign? Because it was a great idea. When HIV positive people take ownership, because they were looking at the science and interpret that but in the beginning it was a pushback on governments like do we really want to put that message out show us the data um then the pharmaceutical listening to the hiv community yeah they stopped and realized like oh science does um support that Yes, we can fund and start, you know, blitzing everybody with the information about it. So individuals who are living with HIV have, um, they're at the forefront of this. And I just wanted to mention, we are at a really crossroads that I hope we seize coming out of the pandemic. And when that question was asked about the um, rapid speed to which the vaccines were um, brought to market, the trials were set up, it was formulated, the infrastructure came from all the research that had been occurring within the HIV field. So I'm hoping that that message can get out there and that people will really, it's kind of, how to put this, if all the efforts and research that HIV um, has or has been undertaken over all these years had not occurred, the availability to put into place and implement global trials as fast as we did, we wouldn't have been able to. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. As a matter of fact, when I was uh, in college back in the 80s and um, and people were talking as they do about HIV and people were saying it's just a gay disease and, you know, we were discussing it from every, you know, as college kids do, they sit around and and argue and debate. Uh, But one of the things that I felt was this is a really unique virus, which makes it a unique opportunity that if we solve this virus, all sorts of uh, coincidental things will fall out of the R&D path that will have benefit in so many areas. And you just brought up one of them that all the money that's gone into, I think there's been like 700 HIV vaccine trials now. Yeah, that's a whole network of people that can be used for COVID vaccines or any other vaccines that are being developed. It's a whole infrastructure, like you said, that that came out of, you know, a sort of a collateral benefit out of HIV research, even though an HIV vaccine hasn't emerged yet. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of money has gone into that. But the the other benefits that have come out is that cracking that virus and understanding how viruses that uh, integrating viruses like that's the birth of gene and cell therapy, which is now the cutting edge in, in medicine and promises uh, or gives us hope for cures, not just to HIV, but to cancer. Right. Yeah. And it came from uh, scientists, you know, either curiosity or government, you know, funding and driving the R and D or whatever, but wherever it comes from, uh, however we get that supported, has value to every single one of us. That's why as we come out of this pandemic, that like everything, it just um, engulfed our entire world. Mm-hmm. Meaning that's what's the main focus. And everything else, all other diseases fell um, off the mainstream, even cancer. But now we're at 
a crossroads, and I hope that we seize on it. It's, it's time to put HIV back out there on the forefront, having individuals who are living with it come forward, um, sharing true science about um, how HIV is transmitted, and also educating the population about the role that HIV played in helping to um, take back society when it comes to COVID. If we do that, I can see us moving forward on addressing many of the issues that we're talking about here, um, fighting, you know, stigmatizing language. And yes, I too want that day when if you stand up and say, oh, how you doing, Orphan? Oh, I'm good. Haven't seen you in a while. What's been going on? Well, you know I'm HIV positive. Yeah, I know. Anyway, how you doing? Are you taking your meds? You know, just like... Yeah, you know, it'd be like anything else. Yeah, no, I think, you know, the, 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 the better treatments we have, and especially if we can find a cure. I mean, imagine the day where, you, you, you know, people can go up to their friend and go, yeah, I had HIV, but, you know, I, I got cell therapy, so, you know, I'm fine now, right? You know, like, and people would be like, oh, yeah, you're not just fine. I hear you can't even recontract it now because you're permanently immune for the rest of your life. You don't even have to, the, that that monster, remember when you were saying the monster? You vanquished it forever, right? I mean, that would be a sweet story. I mean, that's one of the things that drives me in my business is I would love to see people able to say that, you know, to just go like, no, I'm not just, you know, cured of HIV. I'm literally moved to the next level where I can't even get it back. That, yeah. you know, you don't have to worry about me being a danger to you. It's like, you know, I'm just, I left that so far behind that I don't even think about it anymore. That would be a you know an amazing uh, psychology for an HIV a formerly you know sort of HIV infected individual who was taking antiretrovirals every day. Uh, HIV diagnosed individual. I, I'm sorry, I missed that. What's that? HIV diagnosed individual. Yes, thank you. Oh my gosh, I blew it. I just learned that on this on the thing. And then I, I shouldn't have asked you to repeat it again, because maybe I could have got away with it. But now it is right in the spotlight. That's right. I, I learned, get rid of that word infected. Right. And yeah. I, I'll try to remember that. Is there some resource, uh, you know, since you're involved in this, what's the best way to find a little bit more information, maybe online about, you know, how we can start to remove stigmatizing language from uh, you know, even as you can see, uh, the, the CEO of a HIV cure company can can easily uh, make a mistake like this and perpetuate something that he, he really doesn't want to perpetuate, right? So, uh, you know, where can I go to help to make sure it doesn't come out in my language, it doesn't come out in our marketing materials, and where can other people go so that they can join that, that movement uh, to get more information? Well, there's several publications um, the World Health Organization has, if you Google stig HIV stigmatizing language, I think it's like 87 pages of do's and don'ts. And I can share <clears throat> with your team um, the links on the UN AIDS has um, a publication out that it's really good. It's in a grid form, you know, do's and don'ts. And some of the do's and don'ts are, again, this will become a cultural change because let's all be honest, um, at the height of HIV before antiretroviral therapies came along and people were dying, that was a critical need of us addressing. So we weren't really thinking about stigmatizing language of saying, oh, he's HIV infected. Um, there was a term that used to say, oh, he died of full-blown AIDS. 
There's no such thing as full-blown AIDS. <laughs> AIDS is a byproduct, a progression that if HIV is untreated, it can lead to that. Um, but I'll share with your team the link because it's very interesting um, when you go through um, the do's and don'ts and you'll catch it and you'll say, oh, but I also work with the disability community. And if you notice, um, one term that we have now basically eliminated, you still hear people saying it, is, oh, so-and-so is handicapped. Oh, we don't refer to people like that as being handicapped, you know, because that's a negative. What do we say? That person is disabled. They have a disability. So. If people are watching saying, well, what's the big deal if I refer to somebody who is diagnosed with HIV as being HIV infected? I would say to them, words are power and it hurts individuals, even though you may not intentionally be trying to hurt your loved one or anything like that. And it's stemming out of what we're used to saying, but with education, um, we can help eliminate the stigmatizing language. Eliminating the stigmatizing language also reduces the barrier to individuals um, knowing their status and seeking care. So it's more than just, you know, not using a word. And as we spoke about it earlier, depending on where you live, when you hear people referring and using negative words about HIV, if you are positive, you don't want to be thrown into that group, so to say. So either you don't seek care or it can cause you to have trouble with adherence of sharing with your family. So again, all of this is really important to normalize HIV as another, for what it is, it's a virus, that can be controlled. And we're now looking through some of the research that you're doing with gene therapy and other forms of actually curing HIV. And there's a lot in the pipe that I also think long acting. You ask about taking the pill every day. Uh, there's research where um, you will be taking um, an injection at this point, we do have an FDA approved for two months, but we're looking, believe it or not, outwards of six months. So think about it. You're HIV positive. You go see your provider and get your therapy in January. You don't have to come back until July. And that in itself um, can be a great motivator for people knowing your status. And there are other um, things and methods of delivery that I'm excited about. The little patch or how we deliver um, contraceptive methods with the implant. So, I mean, these are all things that once you understand and realize that HIV is a virus, person isn't bad. So you reduce that shame in knowing and normalize it. Where, Jeff, you see me, you go, oh, i like you to meet Orbit. Oh, by the way, he's HIV positive. Oh, okay. And and you move right on. Not even a second thought about it. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can get to that point. I think most people do not want to intentionally or unintentionally cause pain to others. Uh, but you do, you're right, you know, you take some education to understand how to avoid, uh, you know, certain words that may inadvertently be hurting the, those around you. 
or even perpetuating something that, you know, hurts uh, a group of people. I, I think you're, you know, I hear this a lot in every, um, you know, different um, type of, of difference, right? You know, uh, that people don't want to be othered, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you, you mentioned it also, like, you know, there are, you, you compared it to your work uh, with, with people that are impaired or disabled or, uh, you know, that there are certain words that are very easy to adhere to and that make these people feel embraced as opposed to accidentally, you know, making them feel othered. Right. And that you see it in two different communities. What attracted you to working with, uh, you know, with people in that area, um, you know, in particular, I mean, there's, there's, of course, there's every different type of HIV positive person. So, I mean, you could have picked anything. What, what, uh, what uh, got your interest in, in that particular group or was it just coincidental? No, back in 2004, um, at a conference or a meeting here in New York, I met an individual who um, was legally blind and hard of hearing. And he, his vision, and when I say legally blind, his vision was 20 over 400. Right. So he could see if you put something close, but he had the most adorable guide dog. And I came up because I'm an animal lover. And we started to speak, and he shared his story. He was HIV positive, and he lost his hearing and his sight because of the virus. And I was really captivated by, okay, explain that to me. And that's when he explained back then, um, it was a condition CMV. And this was a population that I started to look into. Are there people losing um, their some of their senses because of HIV? And it turns out that there was a population, yet no one at all was talking about it. So he and I said, well, find a need and fill it there's a need to get the word out and educate. So we started um, a nonprofit called Perception for People with Disabilities. Um, we are 501c3 and boom, just started to put that on the table and it's taken off since then to educate. Now the good news is because of the advancement of science and antiretrovirals, um, especially in this country, a person who um, contracts HIV, um, the likelihood that they would lose their sight or become uh, hard of hearing is all but eliminated because, as you may know, now, when you test positive for HIV, um, the recommended guideline is to start therapy immediately, regardless of your CD4 count. And for those who don't know, there was a time when they actually waited until, for lack of a better term, um, became your immune system um, became extremely weakened before they would start therapy. But we now know, again, through science, science is really wonderful, that we start individuals immediately. So progressing to an opportunistic infection or AIDS here in this country, and I say here, globally, we're also doing well, but I think we could do better. Um, but that's how I wanted to help educate everyone about individuals who have disabilities because again um, I've learned not just with HIV but until that situation touches you personally you know you yourself or your family members 
we don't even think twice. Do you know something that's come from the disability community? In all our major cities, when you get to the curb, you see the indentation, yep. which able-bodied people use. When you have your shopping carts or your, um, anything, it's so easy to get on and off the curb. That was created not for the general population. It was sure. created for people with disability. So you see, when we work together and learn about the different situations of human beings, all humanity benefits from it. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a I, I absolutely agree with that. I, I, I just call it caring and empathy, right? You know, caring and empathy are a very special quality of, of humankind and human beings. And it allows us to collaborate in ways that benefit us all and lift us all up. And you provided some examples there. And the other thing that I, I was thinking when you were uh, speaking about, um, you know, the, the something that I did not realize either, that they used to recommend that you wait to take your antiretrovirals until you really needed them. You know, that was, uh, you know, had some negative consequences. Uh, and um, what this means also is there's even more incentive to know your status, right? Exactly. Because you want to look, even if you are perfectly healthy, the earlier you start on that, the less likely you are to have any complications of the fact that, uh, you know, um, that HIV is present, Right. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, another part, another theme that uh, you spoke about earlier, uh, you know, along with c controlling your destiny, making decisions over your life and, and moving forward to towards what you pick out for yourself. And yeah. that's good information to have for folks that are, uh, are, tr are willing and able and trying to do that. So, well, anyway, uh, this has been a fascinating talk. Is there anything else you'd like to add, uh, you know, tell our audience about? Well, I just would like to share, if you are HIV positive, one, I hope that you are on a workable regimen. If you are HIV positive and you're not, get in therapy immediately. Secondly, I want to just say that for everybody, learn about HIV. Um, encourage individuals who are, you know, be supportive of, again, taking small steps to come out to a friend, come out to family members, and for some of you watch and say, it's not that easy. I'm not saying it's always easy, but there is support out there because the more we normalize HIV, and when I say by that, I'm referring to the simple fact that the science has proven that it is treatable. And we are looking, can you believe it? We are actually doing research now that falls under the umbrella of cure. That's amazing. Um, in my journey of HIV, that we wouldn't even use the word cure years ago because it just simply wasn't within the scope of immediate possibility. But the good thing is, and I do believe that we will find the cure and from the different types of research that's going on. And if you hear about some clinical trials related to HIV and cure, I encourage you, I deeply encourage you, join those studies because you, as one person, can really be part of the puzzle that we will answer the question and yes, one day it'll be like, especially future generation. Yeah, I did hear about a disease. What HIV? Yeah, oh, they cured that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate you joining us here today, Orbit. And uh, again, thanks uh, very much for your your views and your input and your information. I uh, hope we'll talk again sometime. Thank you.
Thank you.